Our next session will be on text clustering and speaker will be Professor C.A. Murthy. He will talk on the basics of mathematics, probability and statistics. Actually, professor in charge in Computer and Communication Sciences Division and a professor of Machine Intelligence Unit at this institute. He has received his PhD, MSTAD and PhD degrees all from this very institute. He has published more than 100 research publications. He is also an organizer of this workshop. Now I welcome Professor Shia Murthy on the stage to deliver this lecture. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
covariance basically measures in some sense the linear relationship between the two variables x and y. When x is increasing and y also increases, then the covariance will be greater than zero. When x is increasing but at that time y decreases, then the covariance will be less than zero. And then this covariance is normalized. When it is normalized, you get correlation coefficients. This is the correlation coefficient between the two variables x and y. This is basically covariance of x y divided by square root variance of x, variance of y. So this is the correlation between x and y. And uh, this value lies between minus 1 and 1. The value of the correlation coefficient, it lies between minus 1 and 1. These are some things that you will find in probably any basic statistics book. Now, this has some relevance, in fact, quite a bit of relevance in many problems. Uh, where, especially this is very much uh, you will be needing this thing when the number of variables is much more than the number of observations. Do you all know how a text document is represented? Do you? Uh, you take a document, you need to do some processing on the document, like stop word removal, etc. Okay? And uh, then you will get some words. Suppose you have what, let us just say, how many documents? Say 10,000 documents. You have got say 10,000 documents. And uh, then what you need to do is that you do all the pre-processing, you do the stop word removal, etc., etc. So, then you will get some words in each document. You write down all the words, all the distinct words in all the documents. So no repetitions. And as many words are there in the set of documents, and each word actually is a are uh, in the term in the terms of document clustering, each term is a feature. As many terms are there, you have those many features present. As many terms are there, those many features are present. So if you have ten thousand documents and the number of distinct words is say fifty thousand, okay, then each document will be expressed as a vector of 50,000 components. Each document will be expressed as a vector of 50,000 documents. I suppose all of you must be knowing it by now. Okay? But your number of documents is 10,000. Your number of documents is 10,000. And uh, your number of features is 50,000. Do you actually see any contradiction there? I mean, if I, when you are processing the data, do you actually see any contradiction there? Uh, okay. I mentioned that if the number of features is more than the number of observations, then you have a problem. Do you know what the problem is? High variance. Hello? High variance problem. High? Variance. High variance. Variance. Mm, that is, how is it related? You might have high variance even when the number of features can be less than the number of documents. Where do you have problems when your number of features is more than the number of documents? Uh, 
technical issue. Where's the problem lies? <coughs> Hello? Some document can go to more than one. No, 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 no. I will tell you where the problem lies. Many of the data mining techniques, pattern recognition techniques, are machine learning techniques. <coughs> there is an inherent assumption in all these techniques. The basic assumption is that the number of features is less than the number of documents. If the number of features is less than the number of documents, what happens is that the covariance matrix the covariance matrix, mostly it will be, it, covariance matrix is anyway non-negative definite or positive semi-definite. Do you know the meaning of covariance matrix being positive semi-definite and non-negative definite? Do you know the meaning of that? Uh, see, many of the techniques in these things, they depend on the covariance matrix. If you look at nail base or base station rule, where you assume some distribution, and most of the times you assume normal distribution. Normal distribution means you have a covariance matrix. Okay? The density function of normal distribution is multivariate normal is this. 1 over square root of 2 pi to the power m. If you are talking about m dimensional multivariate normal distribution, then determinant of sigma to the power half and there is exponential minus half. This is the density function of multivariate normal distribution with the number of variables or the number of dimensions is capital M. And sigma is an m by m matrix. Sigma is an m by m matrix. And uh, when you write like this, what I am assuming is that, see, here the determinant of sigma, this sign denotes the determinant of sigma, and there is to the power half. I have to calculate the square root of the determinant of sigma. Now what happens is that, if the determinant is zero, then the matrix will become singular. And then when the matrix becomes singular, then you have a problem in calculating this because zero is appearing in the denominator and you have a problem. Right? Mm -hmm. So, this actually assumes that determinant of sigma is strictly greater than zero. Determinant of sigma is strictly greater than zero. And this won't happen if the number of features is more than the number of observations. If the number of features is more than the number of observations, then the determinant of sigma will be zero. Then you cannot assume This is, so if you cannot assume normality, even for other distributions also, when you have that your main matrix, covariance matrix, if it turns out to be singular, then you have a real serious problem. Many of the techniques that we have, they are going to fail. Many of the techniques that you have, they are going to fail then what one may need to do is that when you reduce the number of features, your number of features is much more than the number of observations, you reduce the number of features in such a way that the number of features is less than the number of observations. Okay? And this gives you the problem of feature selection. Hello, please. This question is that if we are not using Gaussian distribution or okay, um, use this particular thing about the number of features more than the number.
number of observations. This problem gets repeated in many other applications. In many other applications. Well, even if you don't use words and instruments, uh, ultimately what you are asked to do is that whatever may be the methods that you have developed, you are asked to do the theory. And uh, that's where you say proposition. Well, the number of pieces is much more than the number of observations. Well, uh, I agree that you can have some heuristic method. Unfortunately, whatever I am going to do today, they are also basically heuristic methods. They are at a very fundamental level. Okay. But ultimately, at some point of time, when you want to really write a paper and communicate the paper, then you will get a comment from the reviewer that where is the theory set. That's, that is one problem that you are going to so even if you don't make the Gaussian distribution assumption, yet many places this problem is going to haunt you. It is difficult to give you. <coughs> yeah. Is that if there are more than two variables, then do you 
you have any automatic way of saying. Um, but when you talk about the relationship between two variables, it is two variables. What is the meaning of relationship between three variables? Okay, now let us now come to the question of independence. Uh, this question is that, can you actually say that some variable is independent of another variable? Is it that? I have three variables and I want to find out uh, uh, whether they are independent of each other or there is some relation. Independent of each other means again you are taking two variables. Uh, no, we can say that like uh, we have seen two variables x and y might be uh, independent of each other but if you introduce third variable z then it can become... Uh, when x and y are independent of each other even if you include... No, like the, something like conditional. Um, okay, I think for all these things, I will give basically two or three differences which you may have to go through. Uh, the differences that I am going to give, they generally talk about how to measure the relationship between two variables. started wondering whether we can have, I mean, that is that, see, we all know that if x and y are independent, then the correlation coefficient is zero. But the other thing is not true. If the correlation coefficient is zero, it does not mean that x and y are independent. Okay. So, ultimately, we would like to measure the dependency between two random variables. And then there, the actual definitions of the following. We say that two random variables x and y are independent, if so, it was statistical. That is, probability of x belongs to A and y belongs to B is same as probability of x belongs to A times probability of y belongs to B for all A, B. This is the basic definition. And the next definition is that two random variables x and y are said to be dependent if they are not independent. That is the very next definition. But then how much dependent they are, we don't know. So people wanted to measure this dependency between two random variables. And uh, there are several articles on this thing. Uh, people try to use mutual information to measure dependency between two random variables. Mutual information is again a concept in information and then, there is a paper that appeared in 2011 in the Science Magazine. I hope all of you know what Science Magazine is. By Richard Tetov on measuring relationship between two variables in a large data set. So this paper appeared in Science Magazine 2011, December. In fact, the exact date is 2011, December 15. The effects of research. Science. Of the uh, 
relationship that we are taking. That has the number of points and goes to infinity. Then that value actually will go to zero if they are limited. Okay. So, and if there is a perfect relationship between them, functional relationship, then this value will go to one. And if there is something in between, then this value will be in between. So these are the things that we have to show in the uh, And then after this article was published, that was in 2011, December, then by 2012 March, there are so many rejoinders to etc. on this article. And then, in fact, all these things you will find again. And then uh, in 2012 March, uh, it was uh, Dipshitan, who is again a machine learning person. He wrote an article and that was published on internet, that was published in Science Magazine, and as well as it's available on internet. But he had shown one or two small negative points of this article. Okay. And then he suggested that in 2009, there is a paper in applied probability. It's called distance correlation. There, that one may be slightly better than whatever it was. That one may be a better measure of finding relationship between two variables. Because I have forgotten the names of the author, but in applied probability, applied statistics journal, 2009, distance correlation. The paper on distance correlation, but then note that in order to understand this paper, you need to have good, very good knowledge of statistics. It uses characteristic functions and etc. Okay, but then since you are interested in, you are asking me these questions, I am giving you the answer. But to this day, there is no universally accepted, I mean, way of measuring relationship between two variables, universally accepted, I mean, everyone is satisfied with every aspect of the definition. Such a definition of measuring relationship between two variables, people don't know. The one that is acceptable by all in all the situations. Right? Okay. <coughs> um, okay. So, this is basically, if the number of features is more than the number of observations, it is very difficult for you to do many of the mathematics that you have been doing so far. So this is one problem that I wanted to highlight. This is one problem that I wanted to highlight before I go into document structure. So now, document first time. get the natural grouping in the data. That is the basic idea of clustering. But then this, uh, the meaning of the word natural grouping are how do you find the groups that are existing in the data set without really knowing what the groups are? How do you find the groups that are existing in the data set? This is the basic problem of clustering. Um, <coughs> Before I proceed further, I will give you some examples to state this. I mean, I will give you some very relevant examples of clustering, which will probably enlighten you more about the subject. 
when I say that you want to find the groupings that are existing in the data set, there is one natural question that should come to your mind. The question is that, is it necessarily true that two different persons, when they see the same data set, they think that they have the same number of clusters, each cluster containing the, I mean, they will think that they have the, I mean, the clustering of one person is same as the clustering of another person. No. That means, given a data set, is the clustering unique? No. The unfortunate answer is no. I will give you an example to, to say why the answer is no. The general example which I love to give is uh, playing cards are uh, in Bangla, Tash. And uh, I hope all of you know what playing cards are. Okay, there are 52 cards. You have four suits, clubs, diamonds, hearts and spades. Right? Now, that is your data set. Now, you give this 52 cards to a child of probably, let us just say, one or two years old. Then probably what the child would do is that the child would put all the red cards on one side and all the black cards on one side. So you have two clusters. And a slightly grown-up person, what he or she would do is that to put clubs, one, diamonds, hearts and spades. So he will give four clusters. But then the same person can also do all the aces on one side, kings, queens, jacks, you have 13 clusters. Okay? Note that it is the same data set, but then the way you 